Hi, my name is Stephen Sewell. The title of the paper I'll be reading today is The Forgetting Curve. At the Egyptian city of Nocratus, there was a famous old god whose name was Thuth, and he was the inventor of many arts, such as arithmetic, calculation, geometry, astronomy, and draughts and dice. But his great discovery was the use of letters. Now in those days, the god Thamus was the king of the whole country of Egypt, and he dwelt in that great city of Upper Egypt, which the Hellenists called Egyptian Thebes. To them came Thuth, and showed his inventions. When they came to letters, this, said Thuth, will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. Thamus replied, this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learners' souls, because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written characters and not remember of themselves. They will be hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. This is the opening to my performance lecture, How to Purposefully Forget Things. The title is derived from a self-help web article of the same name, and the performance presents these steps for intentionally forgetting alongside myths and histories of memory and technology and the 2014 EU court ruling, The Right to Be Forgotten. I use the myth of Thuth as an opening to the performance because it establishes an early dialectical relationship between memory and technology. This tension between memory and the various technological aids that have been developed throughout history for recording, presenting, and distributing information is still present, and the existence of a web-based self-help article on how to forget things and the right to be forgotten ruling present unique symptoms of this relationship. During the performance, these topics are presented in alternating segments until they can no longer be discussed separately. The fragmented form the performance takes is fractured further by occasional interruptions, non sequiturs, and digressions intended to mimic the distractive, distracted and associative experience of encountering information online. Some of this I have preserved in this talk. For today, I will be presenting research from this performance, mostly focusing on how the right to be forgotten was decided and the results of that decision, as well as certain myths and histories that may help us understand the organizational and operational structure of the internet. The right to be forgotten is a 2014 ruling decided by the EU court in Spain and allows EU citizens to request the removal of links to web pages or other content from search results generated by a name-based search query provided that the requested items are inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant, or no longer relevant. The original lawsuit was brought by a Spanish citizen who was very distressed that a decade-old article published in La Vanguardia that listed their name and address in a repossessed property auctions listing was one of the top items displayed in search results when they googled their own name. They had recovered from their financial troubles and argued that the prominence given to this information in search results was damaging to their personal and professional reputation, and that Google and La Vanguardia should remove it. The European Court of Justice dismissed the plaintiff's claim against La Vanguardia, but ruled in favor over Google, citing an unprecedented right to be forgotten. In order to reach their decision, the court focused on three main issues. Whether Google should be classified as a data controller, whether Google as a non-European Union company was subject to the directive's territorial reach, and finally, if the court answered both questions affirmatively, it was asked to then determine the scope of Google's legal responsibility as a data controller and whether a citizen had the right to have Google erase their data. Google claimed that search engines should not be regarded as data processors or controllers, since the data that they display comes from third parties' web pages and is processed by the search engine without distinguishing between personal data and other information from those pages. Additionally, they claimed that even if that does meet the standard of data processing, they should not be considered a controller since the search engine has, to, has no knowledge of the data displayed and does not exercise control over the data. The EU courts disagreed, stating that it must be found that in exploring the internet automatically, the operator of a search engine that collects such data, which it subsequently retrieves, records, and organizes within the framework of its indexing programs, stores on its servers, 
and as the case may be, discloses and makes available to its users in the form of lists of search results, they must be classified as processors. Furthermore, since the search engine determines the overall dissemination of data by making it accessible in a particular order of preference, the operator of the search engine must be regarded as a controller. On the second matter, Google claimed that since its offices in Spain are not involved with data storage or processing, nor are they involved with the engineering and implementation of Google's search algorithm, that their American-based headquarters are exempt from regulation by the EU. But an EU directive on data protection from 1995 already stated that the processing of personal data does not need to be carried out by the establishment concerned itself, but only that it be carried out in the context of the activities of the establishment. Though all of Google's data processing occurred outside Spain, Google Spain sold advertising space within the country. As a result of Google Spain's online advertisement sales, the court held that the two entities were closely linked. Google Spain was thus effectively a subsidiary of Google Inc., making the geopolitical borders separating the two establishments null, and Google Inc. subject to the directive. With the first two issues decided in the affirmative, all that remained was to determine the scope of Google's legal responsibility as a data controller and whether a citizen had the right to have Google erase their data. The EU court determined in accordance with a prior directive that established the rights of privacy for EU citizens that Google must remove from the list of search results links determined to be inadequate, irrelevant, or no longer relevant, or excessive in relation to those purposes and in light of the time that has elapsed. As a result of the European court's ruling, Google was charged with the establishment of a separate department to receive, review, and grant or deny removal requests. To date, Google has received over 970,000 removal requests, and 46% of those requests have been granted. While the case involved only Google, the ruling extends to all search engines. There are some obvious flaws with the right to be forgotten. First, the name of the case is misleading. It's not really a right to be forgotten, so much as it is a right not to be remembered in a certain way. The ruling does not require the removal of web pages or content, only that the links to that content are no longer displayed in search results. In this context, memory isn't considered a cognitive ability as much as something that exists external to us, a record. But the ontological existence of the record isn't nearly as important as its locatability. Simply put, the ruling relies on the assurance that if it can't be Googled, it doesn't exist. This not only gives us an idea of the extent to which search engines have established dominance culturally over how we use the internet, but also presents epistemological problems regarding knowledge production. I Google, therefore I know, significantly reduces the possibility of contesting the meaning of events and supplants it with a slick empiricism. Furthermore, there is a simultaneous compression and extension of time that occurs when we encounter information in this way. Keyword-based searches provide very minimal context for the information you receive, save for an online publication date. Information regarding the original date and site of publication, reliability and accuracy of the contents, what groups, professional, social, or otherwise it has gained reception in, and information regarding the authors is the responsibility of the user for obtaining. This manner of representing information has an effect of rendering potentially divergent results homogeneous, and the nature of digital information extends the life of content indefinitely. Second, there's the matter of enforcement. Initially, when Google was granted, granted a removal request, they delisted the relevant URLs from Google's search results only in the domain corresponding to the country of origin of the request. Spanish citizens requesting the removal of links from search results would only have those results removed from google.es. This meant that switching from google.es to google.com would result in the display of information that may have been removed from the former. Using this simple workaround effect effectively nullified any effectiveness of the right to be forgotten, and in February 2016, The Guardian reported that Google would begin blocking search results across all of its domains when a search takes place within the European Union. 
If a German resident successfully requests Google remove a search result under queries for their name, the link will not be visible on any version of Google's website, including google.com, when the search engine is accessed from Germany. Google will use the browser's IP address to determine their location. By using the IP address of search queries to geolocate them and amend search results accordingly, we see an imposition of an old map, the physical borders of a nation, onto a previously thought borderless and intangible space. In doing so, it divides and fractures that space in a way that makes the scale of the internet a little easier to imagine, but also reinforces the nation state and its juridical authority. The means used to surveil web activity also further stresses the matter of scale when attempting to comprehend the digital. Monitoring activities on the individual level versus the mass level presents both qualitative and quantitative differences. The tracking of an individual's phone along a road may be considered an invasion of privacy, whereas the tracking of multiple phones along the same road is a traffic report. Third, and perhaps the most obvious question, why did Google's search algorithm determine that articles from over 10 years ago concerning the plaintiff's debts were of relevant interest and feature them so prominently in search results? Neither the arguments nor ruling of the case or Google make any mention of this anomaly. The case merely seeks to correct it rather than attempt to understand how it occurred. What many models for conceiving of memory or constructing memory palaces have in common with Google is a presumed empirical humanism. Man, in the enlightened sense, is positioned at the center of these spaces and as the master of these domains. From this view, data and information is presented according to the individual actions of the user and knowledge is produced by their direct experience and interaction with such information. The form in which that information is presented is presumed to have little or no effect on how that information is received and interpreted. If the form in which we are presented with and encounter information exerts no ideological pressures, then it is hard to see why Google should be responsible for what information is displayed in search results, no matter how outdated, inaccurate, or irrelevant. But perhaps the case itself isn't as important as much as what it reveals about how Google operates and our attitudes toward it. As I've already mentioned, the case underscores the dominant position that search engines hold online, but fails to address what is happening at a structural level. In order to accommodate these external forces, a different model is required. I would like to suggest the labyrinth as a model that may allow us to more fully imagine the digital. The labyrinth in Greek mythology was where the Minotaur was trapped, a maze so cunningly constructed that its designer Daedalus nearly got lost in it. The defeat of the Minotaur by Theseus was only possible thanks to Ariadne, who gave him a ball of thread so that he could trace his way through the labyrinth. The labyrinth is structured in order to disorient one spatially and logically. It does not follow a linear path, it doubles back, traverses, fragments, and distracts. As Jalal Tufik says about labyrinths in his book Vampires, the labyrinth unsettles the one in it, so that they become explicitly lost to the lost others there. To be in the labyrinth is to not know you are in the labyrinth. It is not a space that places man in the center, but rather a space that decenters and directs us by perpetually shifting its configuration. It is not a static singular space to be mastered by the individual, but dynamic spaces of struggle. And it's no surprise that paranoia and skepticism regarding the truth value of the information we encounter and the means used to access it has become pervasive. Prolonged states of distraction and fragmentation are sure to produce paranoia in those lost in the labyrinth. If the purpose of a labyrinth is distraction and fragmentation, then Google has succeeded admirably in concealing itself and presenting to us a simple and intuitive interface that provides us with what Thamus would describe as the appearance of knowledge. Given what we now know of the efforts of algorithms to predict and anticipate our interests, and the strategies employed, such as positive reinforcement, to keep us engaged and immersed in their platforms, the rise of fake news and political extremism online seems inevitable. But the proliferation of misinformation and polarizing content on social media is not solely a result of big tech. And while the algorithms employed have certainly played a role in how quickly such information spreads, 
It is important to recall that these ideas still must originate in the social before they begin to spread online. Acquiring a full understanding of how these ideas come into being is beyond the scope of this paper, but we can look at the historical context in which tech companies came into being and the logics they reproduce as a result. On December 12, 1980, President Jimmy Carter signed into law the Bayh-Dole Act. The act was an amendment to U.S. patent law proposed by Senators Birch Bayh of Indiana and Bob Dole of Kansas, and gave universities, nonprofits, and small businesses the right to retain exclusive ownership of any patents or inventions developed through research funded by federal grants. Prior to the Bayh-Dole Act, the federal government assumed ownership of any patents resulting from federally funded research and non-exclusively licensed them for further development and or application. Senators Bayh and Dole felt that federal control over the licensing of patents was contributing to a stagnant economy, as the non-exclusive licensing that the government granted did not encourage large companies to invest the necessary time and money to bring a new invention to market. As Joseph Allen and Howard Bremer state in their supportive analysis of the Bayh-Dole Act, without the incentive of ownership, wealth creation is not possible. Confident that exclusive patent rights were necessary for research to be properly developed and commercialized, the Bayh-Dole Act was drafted, and after hearing concerns that the act would result in large companies monopolizing patents, the bill's scope was limited to universities, nonprofits, and small businesses. However, In 1983, President Reagan issued a presidential memorandum directing directing federal agencies to extend the rights of exclusive patent ownership to all businesses. Beneficiaries of these newly relaxed restrictions included many major research universities, such as Stanford University, which received a $4.5 million grant from the National Science Foundation in 1994 to fund the Stanford Integrated Digital Library Project. The project was intended to develop the enabling technologies for a single, integrated, and universal library. The multiple years of work and funding involved dozens of researchers and graduate assistants, including Sergey Brin and Lawrence Page, the inventors of Google. The first patent filed for Google was developed as part of the Stanford Integrated Digital Library project. Without the existence of the Bayh-Dole Act, this patent would have been available for public licensing and development. Instead, Google is one of the largest and wealthiest U.S. companies and coincidentally has spent many of the past years acquiring patents while simultaneously lobbying government officials to support legislation that would make the process to purchase patents easier and to oppose legislation that would increase regulation of tech companies. Given the period of prolonged government deregulation and neoliberal politics that preceded Google's development, it is not surprising that their resistance to and arguments against the right to be forgotten reproduce the ideological tenets of free will, private property, and free market capitalism. This laissez-faire attitude denies any responsibility on behalf of Google for the effects of their services on society, while seeking to preserve their unregulated pursuit of profits. As Marx has stated, in fact, the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited. The struggle against fake news, conspiracy theories, and extremism isn't simply about investing social media companies with stronger moral compasses. If they suck the blood of the living, they must know what passes in the other world, and they ought to inform their relations and friends of it, and that is what they do not do. That quote is from the book The Phantom World, a mid-19th century book on spirits and apparitions, and is is specifically in this case expressing horror at the lack of morality in vampires. But it is foolish to ascribe a moral imperative to the undead, as what is lost when one becomes an undead is one's existence as a sensuous being. To be sensuous is to suffer, and the undead do not suffer. Rather, the living suffer under the insatiable thirst of the undead. The valuation of tech companies since the start of the pandemic would seem to suggest that there isn't a lot of suffering happening in Silicon Valley. And if we are going to make any real and lasting changes regarding the use and inclusion of social media in our lives, then the struggle that needs to be taken up in addition to the struggle against misinformation at all is the struggle against the ideological and political structures and logics of capitalism 
that these companies operate by and that defines our contemporary condition. Thank you.